22 years ago, I was the same age as Brother Lytle. So I was 27, 22 years ago. A lot's changed since then. We won't get into the, a lot of the details there, thankfully. But uh, yes, things have changed over the years. And I, I guess what I want to say is uh, right off the bat a few weeks ago, I, I felt the Lord um, giving me direction to deliver this message that I'm going to try to deliver uh, tonight. So uh, I went to Bishop with that. And uh, I just want to thank you, Bishop, for uh, giving me permission uh, to deliver this message. I have no idea what the future holds. Uh, I'm just trying to be obedient for what the Lord told me to do. <clears throat> you know, in, in Acts chapter 7 is the only recorded message from Stephen. And I hope this ends better than, than his experience did when he... <laughs> if you guys hadn't laughed there, I was going to knock on the mic, you know. So. <clears throat> but it's not about the messenger. It's never about the messenger. It's always about the message. And the message has to point to Jesus Christ or we've missed the mark. So that's the, uh, that's the driver for tonight. Uh, Sister Span, you can, uh, I, I, you know, uh, brother, brother Schultz, Brother Greg Schultz, when he found out I was doing a PowerPoint, was not pleased. So then I told him, well, there are only 35 slides, which is true, but some of those are just images, so don't, don't leave yet. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> so tonight we're going to talk about the bunker. And uh, again, this is a message that I felt the Lord uh, had given me. And I'm going to do my best uh, to deliver that message and let the chips fall where they may. So next slide, please. So what is a bunker? It's a defensive military fortification designed to protect people or valued materials from falling bombs or other attacks. Again, that's just a, kind of a textbook definition. Uh, commonly used for protection from nuclear attacks and tornadoes. Uh, very common in World War I and II and the Cold War. In fact, when, uh, when the Lord first, this is actually kind of the way he gave it to me in prayer, was the bunker. And my first thought was World War II bunkers. I, I don't know why. Maybe that has something to do with being 22 years older than Brother Jay, I, I don't know. Maybe that's why that comes to my mind. So uh, anyway, from a natural sense, these are normally underground. Next slide. Is there an echo in here or is this just what I'm hearing? Okay. okay. <laughs> so again, the purpose of the bunker, again, it's a defensive shelter. It's a refuge or a safe haven uh, from the storm, from the blast from the attack or whatever the trouble is. It's again, it, and the, the bunker is gonna contain our provision, again, whatever we need. So again, we have already talked about the main purposes, it's a shelter, uh, but again, so then you're gonna have food and water, you're gonna have the basics to sustain life because again, it's all about survival during the time of attack. And one key that we'll, we'll stress again later is, it's a temporary dwelling. That's the whole intent of a bunker. It's a temp temporary dwelling. Uh, during the time of trouble. So. so again, most of these images of simple bunkers uh, are World War II bunkers, as you can see from the, the lovely attire there. Again, these underground. Uh, next, next slide. So again, I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of the, uh, the exterior, anyway, of, of a bunker. Next slide. Now, let's we'll look at the interior on these next couple of slides. So again, like I said, it's, it's just about survival. It's temporary survival during times of trouble. So you've just got the basics there. You've got, you know, pretty, pretty modest surroundings for most bunkers. So uh, next slide. Yeah, I don't know how well that's you know, showing up for you guys. But uh, again, pretty, pretty modest, uh, the basics just to get by. <clears throat> again. Modest, temporary dwelling is the purpose. Let's talk about the spiritual application. I've got several scriptures here about this, about basically the, uh, the Lord being our bunker, our provision. <clears throat> Psalms 37 and verse 39, 
but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. Next verse is Psalms 32 and 7. A lot of, a lot of scriptures in Psalms about the, the Lord being our help in time of trouble. Um, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. So again, uh, strength in that first verse, hiding place in the second one, all these things referring to uh, the bunker. Next slide, please. Psalms 71 and verse 3. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Again, strong habitation, rock and fortress, all uh, synonymous with bunker. Uh, Psalms 27 and 5. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Again, several uh, synonyms here, pavilion, uh, his tabernacle, and rock, all synonymous with bunker. Next slide. Psalms 144.2, at least in part. Uh, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower, high tower is a new one, and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust. And then in the next verse, uh, Psalms 18, 2, this is uh, David when he had been delivered from Saul, wrote this. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Amen. That's one of my favorites. Uh, next slide, please. For thou, hast been a, for thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. And that's Isaiah 25 and verse 4. Uh, next verse is, because of his strength, I will wait upon thee, for God is my defense. Psalms 59, 9. So again, strength to the poor, uh, shadow from the heat, and God being our defense, all references basically to the Lord being our bunker. Next slide. This would be a good time to mention too. Bishop leaned over to me and he said, are they leaving you enough time? And I said, I have all the time I need, right? <laughs> After he laughed, he said, amen. But you know, so I'm not quite sure how to take that. He, you know, he's the bishop. He can give me the hook anytime he wants, I guess. So. Jeremiah 16 and 19 says, O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. Excellent scripture. Um, Nahum 1 and 7 says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Amen. So again, so often, so many, so often, so many times, the Lord himself is our bunker, and, and he's there to help us in those horrible times that we all experience. Uh, if you feel like you haven't had a really bad time yet, I, I'm sorry, it's gonna, it's gonna find you sooner or later. I just, that's reality. We live this life and uh, things happen beyond our control and uh, we don't have heaven on earth. Uh, but if we live the right way, we, we eventually have heaven. So. Dozens of references in the word to God being our help in the time of trouble. And this, again, this is only a, a small sampling. Next slide. So in addition to the Lord being our bunker and our help in time of trouble, sometimes uh, we can actually be that bunker, that help to one another. And um, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here, and then, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'll take this out now, so so that I'm ready, because I'm going to talk about Bishop, and it's, I know it's going to get emotional. So I'm trying to prepare myself mentally here. <sighs> Galatians 6 and 2. Bear ye one another burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Ephesians 4 and 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. And, uh, you know, that word forbearing... Do a little research 
and it's actually to tolerate, to put up with. It really, it really, you know, it is. And uh, I'm sure there were times Bishop had to tolerate me over, over the years. But the point I really want to make here is I, I look around this room and I, and I do see lots of people that uh, have been a help to me over the years. Um, but I, I can say this. <clears throat> During the lowest points of my life, Bishop's been there for me in a way that I can't really do justice to in uh, talking to you tonight. Uh, I can sum it up by saying that you've been Jesus to me. And, uh, That's what I want in a pastor. Um, and we're not going to know that from hearing somebody preach, teach, or sitting back there in an interview. We're, we're not. And we have, this is why we have to find the mind of God. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'll beg you. I, I'll beg you to pray and fast about this, participate in a 24-hour prayer, because I, I'm desperate for, for the right man at this critical time in our church. And uh, we just must have the mind of the Lord in this. <clears throat> so before I kind of move on and, and change gears here, um, and the fact the way you came up and prayed for me back there didn't make this part any easier, but you know, just, though I appreciated that very much. Uh, it, I, Bishop means so much to me. I, I, I knew that would get emotional. But anyway, the bunker exists to keep us alive, whether it's in a natural sense or in a spiritual sense. And whether that bunker is the Lord uh, or whether it's one another, um, we have that refuge to go to in a time of attack, in a time of trouble. And we all get there at one point or another. Uh, things happen in life. And uh, we need the bunker, and the bunker will keep us alive. Next slide, please. Well, here's the rub. You, you knew I would get to a problem sooner or later, right? It couldn't be all positive. Uh, <clears throat> when did we leave the bunker? So <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 4. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Now, I'm not trying to add to the scripture in any way, uh, but evangelically, if you'll let me speak, I, I would like to say there's a time to go into the bunker and there's a time to leave the bunker. And uh, sometimes I think we get stuck in the bunker. The bunker was never meant to be a way of life. Um, and when, I, when I'm saying these things, I'm, I'm mostly saying these things to me because I feel like the Lord gave me the message for me and wanted me to share it with, with others. So uh, any, anything I say that may sound accusatory, uh, it's pointed at me probably more than anybody. So just please, please keep that in mind. Um, but I will say this, during those times of trouble and despair, when the world kind of comes crashing down around you, and uh, we, you know, we've, we've heard some preaching and teaching along these lines lately, you know, staying in the plow, keep doing the right things, keep plugging away from that bunker, that is a witness to folks. It is, and it, it does mean something, so I'm not going to say it's all negative to stay in the bunker, but I will say that our, our, our witness is limited in the bunker, and how much the Lord can use us is limited by the bunker. Um, yeah, the bunker is a defense and it's a shield, um, but that works both ways. So we'll talk a bit more about this. Next slide, please. This is just an example. <clears throat> 
in uh, Numbers 35 of the cities of refuge that the Lord had the Israelites set up for in case someone accidentally killed a person, uh, the city of refuge they could go to, to to get away from the slayer, the revenger. And uh, the only thing I want to point out here is that uh, there was an appointed time to leave the city of refuge. And again, that was upon the death of the high priest. So that's, that's kind of the main, uh, the main issue I wanted to, to, to point out with, with uh, this scripture setting. And since it's almost 8.30, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. Um, <clears throat> again, that shielding effect of the bunker works both ways. And we, you know, we aren't exposed in the bunker, uh, but also uh, we're not all that effective of a witness in the bunker. So again, there was an appointed time uh, to leave the city of refuge, and uh, typically it was not 22 years uh, to pick on myself a bit. Next slide. So, you know, ha have we become comfortable in our bunker? You know, the, the earlier bunkers I showed were, were just simple modest temporary dwellings to get you by in a time of trouble you know and some of these some of these images are uh, obviously just uh, plans um, some of them are actual uh, images but I mean they're, they're just so ridiculous the, to the extent and what I found is over in uh, Europe they've actually used some of the old uh, bunkers and, and turned them into these mansions and it's just it's just crazy so you can see this uh, kind of a deluxe two-story model underneath a very significant dwelling. Next slide. Now here we have multiple levels, and what you probably can't see is on this side there's a, uh, that's actually a helicopter pad that all that kind of leads up to, so I can't even count how many levels there, but uh, pretty, uh, pretty fancy. Next slide. Now here are the golfer's delight. Put that in there for Brother Holloway. <laughs> So uh, very, very, I mean, if you're going to be in a bunker and you like golf, that's the bunker to be in right there. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, uh, next slide. That's a bunker, folks. Uh, you know, deluxe lighting and swimming pool. It's, it's crazy, but it's a, it's a bunker. Next slide. Very modern uh, furniture and setting. Uh, big screen TV on this side. Next slide. This is the craziest one, and I know it's just uh, it's plans, basically, but uh, you, first of all, you've got a pretty significant mansion on, above ground. But underneath, you can't see all these things, but I'll point them out to you. There's a, there's a billiard room, there's a bowling alley, a swimming pool, and my favorite is down there on the bottom, you can kind of make it out, uh, it's a vintage car collection with an elevator for the cars. It's got it all. Okay. So the point I'm trying to make with a little bit of humor, a very little, some of you might say, is that uh, we can turn our bunkers into something they were never meant to be. And uh, I know I have. <clears throat> so at some point, the Lord calls us out of the bunker. Okay. Next slide. So <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about obedience now, being obedient to what the Lord has, has asked us to do in, in, this, <clears throat> in this scripture setting in 1 Samuel 15. If you, if you look at the whole chapter, you'll see that, that Saul was commanded uh, by God through Samuel uh, to destroy Amalek utterly, uh, totally everything. Um, but Saul and the people kept the best of some of the livestock. And if you, if you look at once Samuel was bringing this up uh, to Saul, you know, Saul tried a couple of different tactics. You know, first he, uh, he tried to argue that he had been obedient, you know, that he had, you know, they had destroyed, he had destroyed uh, all the inhabitants of Amalek. Um, and then once that wasn't working, then he said, well, you know, I did my part, but then it was, it was those darn people. They're the ones that, you know, they, they kept some of the best for themselves. Um, he kind of answered a question that wasn't asked or talked partial obedience and all these things we've heard really good teaching about over the years. It sounds like Saul would have been a pretty good politician. That's kind of the way it looks to me. But 
Let's not talk about politics tonight. I've had enough gloom and doom. But in the scripture setting, uh, chapter 15, verses 22 to 23, and Samuel said, <clears throat> Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Normally that's where we stop when we, when we, when we, talk, about, uh, when we talk about this scripture setting, but I'd, I'd like to go ahead and read the next verse as well. Uh, next couple of verses actually. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And what, you know, what I want to draw your attention to is there, um, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So I, I really think what the scripture is trying to tell us, anytime that we, we place our opinion above God's, it's a problem. And uh, things aren't always going to make sense to us, but if it comes from the Lord, uh, we, we definitely need to listen. Next slide, please. These are the words of Jesus, John 14, 15, and John 15, 14, by coincidence. If you love me, keep my commandments. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Again, that's uh, pretty direct. Next slide, please. <clears throat> but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. So looking at a couple of commentaries, whether the word wait here means uh, to obey and serve or to trust the Lord, you know, I, I honestly think both, both apply you know, to this situation. But how often is God waiting for us when we think we're waiting for him? Um, we've got a lot of preconceived notions. And, and I think sometimes the Lord's just waiting for us to budge. And when we're hunkered down in that bunker, sometimes we just, we just really don't hear what the Lord's saying to us. Sometimes we hear it and we think, yeah, that yeah, can't be what he's saying. So I will touch on that again in a little while. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I wanted to, you know, have a good example now. I'd already picked on Saul. So now here, Naaman, Naaman dipped seven times in Jordan in 2 Kings 5. Um, it didn't make sense to him. You know, a lot of times we read, we read that scripture setting, and, and you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that he wasn't real happy about what he was commanded to do. It didn't make sense to him. It wasn't logical. But he did it, and uh, because he obeyed, he was healed. And that's, uh, that's a good lesson for us. And at some point in time, obedience will bring us out of the bunker. You know, so, so I guess the question is, uh, why aren't we obedient sometimes? Because very rarely, I think, do we blatantly um, disobey the Lord. You know, I think most of us, we, we want to do right. We want, we want to be right. We wanna, we're trying to follow the Lord. That's, that's why we're here. And, uh, but yet, I, I think there is a disconnect at times. And... Uh, the next, the next slide is really kind of what I'm building up to. Um, Ecclesiastes 11, 4 to 6. We'll read the first portion of that. <clears throat> he that observeth the wind shall not sow. He that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. So basically... Um, when you're looking into potential problems or making excuses, that, that's, that's a big reason, I think, why we don't follow the Lord. But like, oh, Lord, you, you can't mean that because if I do this, and then this, this, and this are going to happen. Or, or I can't do this because of this and this. Um, and the other part of that is we kind of like a rigged game. We don't like to step out there. We like to know that we're going to be successful in what we do. But sometimes I think God just tells us to do something um, so that we be obedient to him. And maybe, again, we have these preconceived notions, and some of us, I think, have stepped out in the past, and maybe we didn't see the results that we wanted to, so then we're afraid to step out again. So it's that fear of rejection. 
uh, and those hurts and those things that kind of make us crawl in the bunker, crawl us, crawl back into the bunker. We've had some really good services over the years where I think some of us will, will climb out of the bunker, the Lord will bless us because the Lord's, the Lord's good and he's wanting to bless us and take care of us. Um, we get touched, we feel better, maybe the Lord gave us a little direction and then we get in our cars, we drive back home, we climb back in our bunker because it's safe. And uh, it's what we're accustomed to. Let's, let's look at the second half of this scripture. Next slide. In the morning sow thy seed, in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall, uh, whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. So basically, the scripture is just telling us just to do what we're supposed to do. Do the good, do what, do what we're commanded, do what good we know to do, and leave the rest in God's hands. I will say in, in 1 Corinthians 3 and 6, Paul states, I have planted a polis water, but God gave the increase. It's not up to us to give the increase. No man, that's, how, that's why no man uh, can glory. It's all about the Lord, but we're always trying to figure things out. You know, and... Uh, it's, it's definitely a weakness of mine that I, won't, uh, that I won't focus on tonight because of the time. But when you're, uh, I do root cause analysis for my job. That's a lot of what I do to, to find out why things went wrong. And uh, while that may be helpful in the natural world to do some troubleshooting and things like that, it's not so helpful in the spiritual world sometimes. It's just, uh, we just need to accept what the Lord says and then and, and roll with it. Um, Big point I do want to make here, though, is false humility is not obedience. Next slide. Here we have a setting with Moses uh, talking to God and God's reply in uh, Exodus 4, verses 10 and 11. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am of slow speech and of a slow tongue. So basically, if you want to boil that down to what he's saying is, you know, Lord, you, you made me this way. Then you told me to go speak to your people, but you didn't heal me first. I'm, I'm still this way. And uh, you look at the Lord's response. And the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf? or the seen or the blind, have not I the Lord? Are we really going to question the Lord's judgment or his decision making? Um, again, so a lot of times it, it really is false humility. We say, I can't do that. I'm not this or I'm not that. I'm not skilled in this or I'm not that. If the Lord tells you to do it, he makes you able to do it. And it's him that's doing it. It's, it's not us anyway. And um, I'll go a little deeper into that in, in just a minute here. But really what it comes down to is false humility is really a lack of faith. Plain and simple, when the Lord tells us something, we're, we're supposed to do it. And uh, that's really what it boils down to. And I've been uh, very guilty of this over the years. Next slide. Here's a scripture in John 10:10 10, 10 about Jesus about talking about having uh, life and having it more abundantly. And uh, there's, there is no abundant life in the bunker. Trust me. I can assure you of this fact. You know, God still loves us and He blesses us, but uh, He can only do so much with us. You know, I talked about, you know, the the bunker does have those shielding properties, those defensive properties, but um, again, that that kind of works both ways. We've still put something between us and God at that point, even when something that was there to keep us alive at one point um, can actually hinder us if we stay in there past the time we're supposed to be. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is a, a season of change. I really think it's, it's time for a transition. You know, maybe, maybe this is just for me, but I don't, I don't think so. But uh, I know this much. The Lord gave me this message, and he told me to deliver it. And I'm, and I'm going to, you know, finish laying it out here in the next few minutes. And uh, 
this message is, is this from the Lord. This is the Lord speaking. A transition from defense to offense. Okay, so in the bunker, there's no offense in the bunker. It's strictly defensive. You're just, you're just there to stay alive, um, to get through the blast, to get through the time of trouble. It gets time to transition from survival, just getting by to victory. From self-preservation to helping others, you know, sometimes I think we hunker down for so long in the bunker that I really think that, that at some point the devil says, you know, I guess I'm not going to get this guy. I guess he'll squeak in, but I'm going to keep him down so that he can't take anybody with him. You know, I, I mean, I really, I really think that's the way the, the devil looks at us sometimes when we, when we hunker down in that bunker. He'll, like, he'll take the loss of one, but as, you know, as long as you don't help anybody else, he's, uh, I think he's willing to ride us off to a degree, but he'll, he'll keep us down as long as he can as, and really as long as we let him. So we've talked a lot over the years about um, this church specifically being like a hospital. And hospitals are good. And people need hospitals. I think we have all needed hospitals from time to time. That's a good thing, uh, spiritually and physically. And I think maybe it's time to go from a hospital to an infantry, though. Yeah. Back from defense to offense. And what I want to bring up is MASH, and I'm not talking about the show with Alan Alda from the 70s and 80s. There's my, there's my age again. <clears throat> but, you know, anybody know what MASH stands for, the acronym? Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. So when I say I think it's time for a transition from a hospital to an infantry, I don't mean to do away with the hospital. I mean it's time to take the hospital outside of these walls. Because in a way, the church has been like a bunker for all of us, and we've needed it over the years. We've all been wounded from time to time. But we can't just keep it to ourselves. I think it's time to make the hospital mobile and take it out to the people that need it. Thank you, Jesus. Help us, God. Help us, God. And, and this last, this last uh, transition here is from the bunker to the foxhole. And, again, the bunker's defensive, but the foxhole is not. It's got a defensive... Uh, there is some protection there. But for the next slide, please. You know, but, you know, you get a gun now. You know, so you're on, you're on the offense. Some of you in here like guns. I'm not going to point any of you out, but, you know, we get out of the bunker and into the foxhole, we get, a, we get a shoot at the enemy. Just wanted to clarify that. Next slide. <laughs> this is just more of a drawing to give you a better idea of what you're, but the point is, you know, there's an arrow on there, and underneath it, it says target direction. Uh, you know, when you're in the foxhole, you're on the offense. You're not just on the defense anymore. And, uh, I, you know, I, I really think it's time for us um, to not just be on the defense, perhaps to be on the offense sometimes. Next slide. <clears throat> These there are some, a few lyrics from a song that I like, Bless the Broken Road. Um, I like the Sela version, not the, uh, what I would refer to as the Hillbilly version by Rascal Flatts. If you like country music, I'm sorry, I, I can't take it. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll read this quickly. I think about the years I spent just passing through. I spent the better part of 22 years just passing through. And uh, I'll confess that before my church family tonight, and uh, I'm not proud of that. But I'm also not living in the past. Uh, I'd like to have the time I lost and give it back to you. But you just smile and take my hand. You've been there, you understand. It's all part of a grander plan that is coming true. So um, God, again, is so gracious and long-suffering. And we've got to get to the point where we don't let our hurts control us forever. The bunker can keep us alive. Um, but then the bunker can also become our tomb. And, you know, and, and I, gotta, I will admit, uh, the first version of this PowerPoint, I had a subtitle, Safe Haven or Tomb, 
under the bunker, and I thought, I can't give away the ending right at the beginning. It's a little harsh, too, and I thought, it, you know, probably because it hit me a little too close to home, the whole subject, I guess. But, you know, I believe I had to deliver this message to come out of my bunker, and uh, I, I honestly, I cannot express to you, my, my church family, I cannot express to you how much I did not want to do this. I'm just being honest. And uh, the Lord's given me several messages over the last couple of years that I have not delivered. <clears throat> and again, I don't know what the, what the Lord has in store, uh, but I'm determined to be obedient. So, uh, you know, I, I guess you can go to the last slide. This is the slide you've all been looking for. Here it is. At a quarter till nine. Uh, those messages I've just shrugged off, and I'm going to be real transparent here. Uh, it's probably fitting that the, the classes are not around. Uh, and again, not blatant disobedience. I just shrugged it off. The Lord gave me a message. And I'd say, uh, really? You, 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 you want me, a man who's been divorced twice, to speak uh, to my church family? Uh, that's false humility. How's that any different from Moses saying, I'm of slow speech and you want me to go talk to your people? I'm not going to question the Lord anymore. You know, it's funny I say that. And I'm eating my word. I don't like the taste of my own words, but you think it's an acquired taste. I get used to it. The older I get, the less I say never. I have noticed that. Uh, there is there's something to be said for just being obedient just being obedient um, and I got to say it was a few Fridays ago when the Lord laid this on me and um, I just said yes I said alright Lord I'll, I'll contact Bishop in the morning I mean it was after 7 o'clock at night so I knew he'd be in bed <laughs> I said I'll get with him tomorrow but anyway uh, joking aside I just said yes and uh, I felt a release in the spirit right then I don't know the significance of it still. I, I honestly, I don't. And uh, when I find out more, I'll let you know. But uh, I don't know what it means. Um, we can't let our mistakes and our hurts control us forever. Um, Philippians 3, verses 13 to 14 say in part, this is Paul speaking, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Obedience. Obedience is the key to getting out of the bunker. So I just want you to ask yourself tonight, are you in the bunker? And if you are, maybe you need to be. Maybe you're in a situation where the bunker is the place for you to be right now, and that's the safe haven for you right now. But if you're in the bunker, ask yourself the next question, should I still be there? And also, what is the Lord dealing with me about that I'm supposed to do that, that I'm not doing because I'm pretending I'm humble? And, and folks, again, I'm just, I'm just laying myself out here and, and, and telling you that this is what I've done. And uh, this is the message the Lord gave me to give to you tonight. Can we stand? <clears throat>